7 o'clock on the dot. Good morning and happy Thursday to you. It is September 3rd. Welcome to the Local 44 Morning Brew. I'm Abby Fridman here with Libby Faro and meteorologist Haley Boulay. Good morning, everybody. Coming up, Black Lives Matter protests continue throughout the Queen City. What Burlington's mayor is saying about protesters' demands. Then, don't believe everything you hear on the phone. A warning to Vermonters about scammers, what you need to look out for. All right, that's a really important story. Definitely. Definitely want to stay tuned for that one. Up first, though, quick look at the weather. Yeah, it's a pretty pleasant start to the day. Despite a few folks waking up to some fog this morning, we are looking at that sunshine overhead. A few fair weather clouds overhead in the Adirondacks. A live look. We are seeing those clouds and a little bit of some uh, chop on the lake there. Temps right now 48 degrees, visibility about zero miles at the airport there because that dew point's right nearby. This observation obviously not from Mirror Lake because the visibility is pretty good, but just a few miles down the road, you get the idea. Visibility drops pretty quick. Sunshine over the Champlain Valley with some wispy high cirrus clouds. And we are seeing that fog filling in right along the Winooski River Valley. Pretty cool view there. It's 62 degrees, the dew point of 59. Those dew points steadily falling this morning. And in typical Northeast Kingdom, you're sucked in the fog this morning. 56 degrees, that dew point right nearby at 55. Hey, the Labor Day weekend forecast is looking pretty good. There is a little bit of an exception for Labor Day itself with some unsettled weather. Breezy conditions too. Temperatures are falling back into the 70s, tracking a change in the heat and a change in the humidity. All coming up in just a few minutes. Till then, Abby and Libby, back over to you. All right, thank you, Haley. As protests continue in the Queen City over the Black Lives Matter movement and the shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin, protesters are demanding the firing of three Burlington officers who have been involved in use of force incidents. Those officers are Corey Campbell, Jason Bellavance, and Joseph Corro. Wednesday, an attorney representing Burlington Police Officers Association, Richard Cassidy, addressed those demands, saying the conduct was reviewed by the city, which found no significant wrongdoing. Cassidy said that because each officer was disciplined, those cases are closed. Terminating their employment now would violate the collective bargaining agreement. Mayor Weinberger said he's discussed these demands with protesters. Uh, varying degrees of discipline were, were handed out in the with the with the different incidents and that's the process we have that is the lawful orderly process we have and uh, the city attorney has released memos and we have shared this information with the protesters about um uh, about really uh, the the limitations within the law of, of reopening and revisiting that Weinberger did say he's opening to discussing any future changes to officer discipline, adding he believes it is problematic that only the police chief has a formal role in disciplining officers. The New York State Attorney General's office is investigating the death of an unarmed, unclothed black man while police were taking him into custody back in March. Recently released body cam footage shows officers placing a bag over Daniel Perdue's head Prude's head, I should say. His family says they deprived him of oxygen for nearly 20 minutes. Now they want charges filed against those involved. Ky Kayla Green from our sister station in Rochester has more from his family. We do want to warn you, this video is graphic. I placed a phone call for my brother to get help, not for my brother to get lynched. Joe Prude says his brother Daniel was killed by police in March. He says he called police because he believed Daniel was on the verge of a breakdown. This is body camera footage the family received from the city after filing a freedom of information request. Joe says Daniel was lying down naked, handcuffed and unarmed when officers killed him. Joe was passionate earlier when recalling the incident. When I tell this particular officer that comes to my door, my brother ain't a threat to nobody but him damn self. Don't kill my damn brother. And not even 15 minutes later, they come back talking about my brother's dead. Now, how am I supposed to feel? He says one officer pushed his knee into Daniel's back while another pushed his head into the ground. Black Lives Matter leader Stanley Martin says officers put a bag over Daniel's head and taunted him. She says less than 10 minutes after officers handcuffed him, Daniel was brain dead. He was taken to the hospital and put on life support and later died. We are disgusted that Mayor Lovely Warren and La Chief Laron Singletary have made no effort to hold Daniel Prude's murderers accountable. In fact, Daniel Prude's killers are still on active duty today. 
According to the autopsy report, Prude's death has been ruled a homicide. The report says he died from complications of asphyxia due to physical restraint. Joe says his brother deserves justice. How many more brothers got to die for society to understand that this needs to stop? And I can't even share with y'all the pain that I'm feeling and my family is going through as well. Now a look at safety matters. Vermont Utilities wants you to know about a phone scam where the caller demands money and threatens to cut off your power. Apparently dozens of customers have received the call. The scammers are calling to be calling from the about all of the state power companies. Utilities say they'd never call with that message. You are urged to hang up but report the call to the Attorney General's office. The deployments of some of the Green Mountain Boys have now been moved up. They'll be starting later on this month. More than 70 members of Vermont Air National Guard's 158th Fighter Wing are deploying overseas for up to six months. The deployments themselves are not new. In fact, they were originally planned to begin in October. But the Guard says COVID-19 precautions have forced the timetable to be moved up. To support the Air Force Central Command, European Command and Africa Command. And New Hampshire health experts say they've found the first batch of mosquitoes in the state to test positive for the West Nile virus this year. This happened in Manchester. West Nile is transmitted to humans from the bite of an infected mosquito. The most recent human case was in an adult three years ago, and we will be right back. This is Local 44 Morning Brew with Abby Friedman, Libby Faro, and Sky Tracker meteorologist Haley Boulay. Now, meteorologist Haley Boulay with your Sky Tracker forecast. Good morning, everybody. 709, waking up to a bit of fog as we take a live look over the Northeast Kingdom. This morning, the sunshine trying to break free, but many of our river valleys are seeing the fog, big time fog through Essex and Caledonia County at this hour. Also, southward on the Connecticut River Valley. Definitely waking up to the fog. Same story in Saranac Lake. We had a little bit of rain overnight and it helped to bring enough moisture to get those dew points and temperatures right near each other. 62 degrees for Burlington, 48 in Saranac Lake, 58 for Plattsburgh, 60 right now in St. J and 63 down in Lebanon. Dew points falling actually through the morning. So we were starting off in the low 60s, like places like Burlington, 62 degrees was your dew point 
early this morning. We've now dropped back to 59. Drier air slowly filtering in. So once we clear out the morning fog, we are settling into a very quiet and sunny stretch of weather. And 70s all across the board on the seven day forecast except for today. Now yesterday we saw a little frontal boundary pass on by. What that did was help to take away the humidity. You can see it right there on the board. But today's front, or I should say tonight's front, will help to take away the heat. Those above average temperatures are settling back to average, if not below average, as we see this front here cruise on by. Now as it does so, it kind of falls apart, so it doesn't really have a lot of moisture, not packing a punch, not expecting showers and storms with it. Maybe a few sprinkles overnight. That is about it. And then we're mostly sunny for the weekend. So the fog very visible on future tracker, but clearing out. We do have a little disturbance well off the coast that is giving us a little bit of cloud debris for the afternoon. Filtered sunshine, not out of the question, but I'd still grab the sunglasses as you head out the door. Temps low 80s and upper 70s while dew points settle back by 3 o'clock into the mid 50s all around the region and winds are south at 5 to 10. Overnight, we clear out any cloud cover, but not long before that frontal boundary slowly sneaks on in. Now, see how it kind of falls apart as it moves through the St. Lawrence River Valley, Franklin County, a couple of sprinkles, and this is at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, so many folks won't even know it had rained because we're mostly sunny by the time we reach Friday morning with temperatures in the 50s and 40s. Now, Friday's forecast, mostly sunny, gorgeous weather ahead, and our temperatures are climbing into the mid-70s at times. It is going to be feeling much cooler and much cooler more comfortable than where we were, say, midweek. And hey, not a lot of rain in the drought forecast. This will be updated later on this morning, hoping that some of the heavy rain that we saw last Saturday can maybe take a chunk out of some of that moderate drought, especially in southern zones. Not a lot of rain on the seven-day forecast. Next chance comes Monday. Labor Day forecast looking unsettled with scattered showers and breezy conditions. To the latest check of the forecast, if you missed anything, head on over to myshamplainvalley.com. Click on the weather tab. The latest forecast update will be there shortly. Unemployment rates have skyrocketed all across the country during the pandemic. That includes right here in Vermont. And while things have gotten better, the Department of Labor says people still need jobs. So they're hosting some virtual job fairs. Local 44's Courtney Adelman joins us live from the newsroom this morning with more on what they're doing. Good morning, Courtney. Well, good morning, Abby. Yes, if you're unemployed right now and looking for a job, or if you're an employer who needs employees, well, the Vermont Department of Labor wants to help you. You can simply go onto their website and find their virtual job fairs called hashtag Hiring Today Vermont Virtual Job Fairs, and they're starting today. Hashtag Hiring Today Vermont Virtual Job Fairs are free virtual events that allow job seekers and employers to join in on a meeting. So they will hear information from the company about what they have for openings, a little bit about the culture of their organization or their business, um, some information about um, benefits. And, and, and those types of things. Job seekers will then be given instructions on how to apply to a certain job. Business service manager with the Department of Labor, Cindy Robillard, says the department recognizes the pandemic has had a major impact on the hiring process and they wanted to help in all ways possible. And it just allows for um, it to be job search to be done safely and um, remotely and um, it, it's really good for that first initial um, contact. These virtual job fairs initially started in the middle of the summer, but the Department of Labor saw another need this fall and have added additional job fairs starting September 3rd and going until October. Each job fair will highlight statewide jobs and jobs in specific areas. We've got 13 job fairs scheduled for the month of September alone, and there may be more added depending on the demand. According to the Department of Labor's website, in April, Vermont's unemployment rate was at 16.5. In July, most recent numbers show the unemployment rate at 8.3. I do think that we'll continue to see success and we'll continue to see increased attendance. And you can register for these job fairs online, although a registration is not required. Live in the newsroom, Courtney Adelman, back to you, Abby.
All right, thank you, Courtney. A state park with plenty to offer just in time for fall. Coming up, you might be surprised with what we find at this place in history. Local news that matters on Local 44 News. Local news that matters on Local 44 News. At this place in history, we're in Waterbury at Little River State Park with Executive Director of the Vermont Historical Society, Steve Perkins. Steve, I know where we are. I've done this history hike before. I love it. Well, you know, we're going to try to get everybody outside and enjoying Vermont as we roll into the fall here. And we're going to explore this history hike. So we're going to look at kind of an abandoned hill farms in Vermont. This is indicative of what you're going to find throughout the Green Mountains, um, but this is all preserved as a nice hike. It's easily accessible, and so I think it's going to be something that we can show our viewers, and they're going to love to go do themselves. So do you want to go take a little bit of a hike? Let's do it. Perfect. So we've stopped at the edge of what was the Ricker Farm or the Ricker property. What can you tell us about this spot? Well, I'm going to read to you about okay. it here because I have my handy dandy guide to the history hike. And it says the Gideon Ricker Farm was 250 acres. The original house was built in the 1830s. He purchased the land in 1839 for $1,500. He added a two family house and the main barn, the ridge pole, was a single 84 foot spruce log that was cut right here on Ricker Mountain. And then the cow barn was 120 feet long. So if you can imagine that wow. within this landscape. Even without the trees, this area is very rugged. I can't imagine farming here. What were some of the challenges? Gosh, I can't imagine farming <laughs> here either. I mean, I think we can imagine the, the, the challenges. So you're on a mountain in Vermont. So your growing season is really short. The side of the hill doesn't have much soil depth. So when you're thinking about farming and kind of pulling those nutrients out of the soil on a regular basis, especially in the 19th century, this didn't work. And then anytime there was a big flood, it would just wash that topsoil away. So though there were a lot of farms and a lot of people living in this area, relatively speaking, um, it was tough. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to use the word vibrant. It was not a vibrant community. Um, it was t a tough life. So they did everything from, you know, they had cows, they had dairies, they had maple sugar, they did a lot of logging, um, but it really was subsistence farming. 
And is that why we don't see farms here today? It is. I think a lot of people who come visit Little River, they know about the reservoir and think, oh, they just flooded out all the farms. So yes, there are farms underneath the reservoir, mm -hmm. but they were long gone. By the time World War I rolled around, so we're talking about like 1917, 1918, most of this area was abandoned. I think the last person left in the, in the early 1920s, and it started to get bought up by the power companies, the, what later became Green Mountain Power, thinking that they would build a dam for hydroelectric, so they wanted all of the watershed. So really, by the time the reservoir was built, there were no farms here. Everyone had just left, and all that's left are cellar holes. Yeah, so we want to talk more about what evidence people can see if they come here. Obviously, cellar holes, we've got stone walls everywhere. What else? There's a lot of like equipment buried in the woods here, too, and even cemeteries. There are three cemeteries just on this hike alone, and they're very readable. So you can see there's one right beyond the Ricker house, and you can see who was buried there and, and when. And then the roads themselves. A lot of these hiking trails are roads. You can see the stone walls running up and down either side. So for me, I love it. It's a great place to come and you just kind of imagine no trees, farms, and people living off of this land. And, and now, you know, it's a wilderness. At this place in history. Local news that matters on Local 44 News. Huh. 723, good morning and thanks for joining us. I'm Abby Fridman. And I'm Libby Farrell. Rutland Regional Medical Center will again host a pop-up testing site on campus to help put people at ease following the recent outbreak in Killington. A steady stream of people got a test Wednesday. We're told the entire process went quickly. People were in and out in about 10 to 15 minutes. Pop-up testing will be going at RRMC from 9 until 3 through Saturday. Vermont schools are preparing to reopen next Tuesday, and in Burlington, officials took questions from the community in a town hall meeting. Mayor Murrow Weinberger and Superintendent Tom Flanagan were joined by a pediatric infectious disease specialist who attempted to reassure concerned parents and noted that school-based studies have shown that children infrequently spread COVID-19 to other students or adults and said kids are also less efficient at transmitting the virus. There's also been optimism. A mask mandate has been put in place for youth and adult recreational league sports in Vermont. This is according to the latest guidelines from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Many sports like soccer and lacrosse were not held to a mask mandate when the ACCD released their initial recreation sports restart guidance back in June. The state's guidelines for middle and high school fall, fall sports also say the teams need face coverings for practice and games. 
The mandate will happen September 8th, which is the same day schools all across the Green Mountain State are set to open. The deployments of some, some of the Green Mountain boys are now moved up. They're going to start later this month. More than 70 members of the Vermont Air National Guard's 158th Fighter Wing are deploying overseas for up to six months. The deployments themselves are not new. They were originally planned to be in October, but the Guard says COVID-19 precautions have forced the timeable to be moved up. No word on exactly where the airmen are going, but they'll deploy in small groups to support the Air Force Central Command, European Command, and Africa Command. Vermont utilities want you to know about a phone scam where the callers demand money and threaten to cut off your power. Apparently, dozens have received these calls. The scammers are claiming to be from just about all of the state's power companies. The utilities say they would never call with that message. You are urged to hang up, but also report the call to the Attorney General's office. In New Hampshire, health experts say they found the first batch of mosquitoes in the state to test positive for West Nile virus this year. This happened in Manchester. West Nile is transmitted to humans from the bite of an infected mosquito. The most recent human case was in an adult three years ago. Now, meteorologist Haley Boulay with your Sky Tracker forecast. Good morning, everybody. 726. A live look over the Champlain Valley shows plenty of sunshine overhead, a few fair weather cirrus clouds, but a lot of fog filling in in the Winooski River Valley. And the fog is also for folks, Pesumsic, Connecticut, you know, the typical foggy locations, especially during fall. Waking up, current temp 62 degrees, a dew point falling back into the upper 50s now. Dryer air slowly filtering in. We're at 48 degrees for Saranac Lake, 62 in Burlington, 60 right now in St. Jay, and 59 in Montpelier. Dew point settling back into the mid 50s, even 40s at this hour. So today we have mostly sunny skies to start. Maybe a few more clouds filtering out the sunshine as we look into the afternoon. But quieter weather for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. More unsettled for Memorial Day. You're watching local news that matters. This is Local 44 Morning Brew. It's Thursday, September 3rd, and welcome to Local 44 Morning Brew. I'm Libby Faro here with Abby Friedman and meteorologist Haley Boulay. Good morning. Good morning, folks. Coming up, officials address safety in schools. Why one specialist is hopeful about the return of students. Then Congressman Peter Welch is looking to help educators. Get an update on the HEROES Act. And we all could use a relatable story about pushing through adversity right now. This athlete has plenty to share. We hear what her aspirations are coming up. All right, but up first, um, I don't know about you. I'm really looking forward to this nice Labor Day weekend. Yes, but we Labor just have Day, to get not through Memorial Day for those of you oh. who were here before the break. I didn't even realize you were doing that. My brain that. was like Oops. Memorial Day. I like jumped backwards oh, for summer, right? You know what? This whole summer has been, it's been a blur. It's gone by too quick. It really I has. I wish it was Memorial Day and not Labor Day. I know, right? Not the end of summer, right? We have to get through today first, though. Yeah, today's not going to be a terrible day. In terms of precip, nothing really on the board, but we do have a little bit more cloud cover to deal with, especially in the afternoon. And some fog waking up, taking a live look over the Northeast Kingdom. Right now, current temps are in the 50s, but the dew points are right nearby. 56 degrees, and that means the fog 
has really filled in when those two meet. So current temps around the region 62 in Burlington, 59 in Montpelier, 48 in Saranac Lake and 54 in Messina, 61 in Rutland and 63 for Springfield. Dew points creeping down. We had a frontal boundary pass through overnight and now those dew points are falling back. Winds are much calmer than yesterday. Yesterday was a breezy day, wasn't it? Lake forecast again. The waves are much, much lighter. It was three to five foot seas yesterday. I know uh, it was a pretty choppy ride on the ferry. Quiet weather for Friday with temps in the 70s and we'll have your full Labor Day weekend forecast coming up in just a few minutes. Till then, Libby and Abby back over to you. All right, thank you, Haley. Let's take a look at the coronavirus numbers across our region. Three new cases in Vermont, two are in Bennington County, the third one in Rutland, one Vermonter is hospitalized. No new cases in Grafton or in Sullivan counties, also no new deaths anywhere in New Hampshire, but 15 new cases reported across the state. And in New York's North Country, one more COVID patient at Essex Center in Elizabethtown has died. That's the seventh death from the outbreak there. There are no new cases anywhere else. Rutland Regional Medical Center will again host a pop-up testing site on campus to help put people at ease following the recent outbreak in Killington. A steady stream of people got a test Wednesday. We're told the entire process went quickly. People were in and out in about 10 to 15 minutes. Vice President of Clinical Services Jonathan Reynolds talked about the importance of supporting the community. You know, one of the main things we're trying to do is support our uh, partners in the Vermont Department of Health. Um, they contact, contacted us yesterday uh, for uh, help in this event, and uh, we are happy to try to turn this around in such a quick period uh, so that we can uh, support our local community together. If not, having a doctor's recommendation will help things run smoothly. Pop-up testing will be going at RRMC from 9 to 3 through Saturday. As Vermont schools are preparing to open up next Tuesday, Burlington officials took questions from the community in a town hall meeting. Local 44's Devin Bates has more. Mayor Moreau Weinberger and Superintendent Thomas Flanagan were joined by Pediatric Infectious Disease Specialist Dr. William Razka, who opened his remarks with an attempt to reassure concerned parents. If there's any take-home message from anything I say, I want everyone who's listening to that to this, this, this discussion tonight to remember that the prevalence rate in Vermont is much lower than almost anywhere else in the United States. Everyone is barraged every day, but the numbers across the United States, rising rates here and there, astronomical surges here and there, particularly in the Sun Belt, that is not Vermont. Dr. Raska also noted that school-based studies have shown that children infrequently spread COVID-19 to other students or adults, and said kids are also less efficient at transmitting the virus. There's also been optimism over the fact that Vermont didn't see any outbreaks when child care centers reopened. Schools may be even a bit safer than most other public spaces because we're going to be screening people to go in. We're going to be monitoring very carefully. We're going to do contact isolation. I think it's actually be a very safe public space. But there will be some child that will be diagnosed with COVID-19. And the state health department has really elaborate plans, just as you mentioned, that as soon as we identify a person, we're going to do contact tracing. One town hall participant asked about recent comments from Vermont Education Secretary Dan French that suggested schools could enter step three of reopening as early as two weeks from now. That would allow for expanded in-person learning beyond the two days that the district's hybrid model currently allows for. It indicates that we are, we are more ready to come back fully in person but it's not a signal that we have to come back. My goal is to be back as, as soon as we can. I'm, I'm hoping early October. Uh, and there's a lot of, there's a lot to work out, uh, a lot of details to work out to make sure that we can do that. The district is also planning to send out an updated draft of their health and safety guidelines later this week after the state reduced physical distancing requirements from six feet to three to six feet inside schools. That's allowed more students to be inside the building at once and the district has used that to give the option for special needs students to learn in person four days a week. In Burlington, Devin Bates, Local 44 News. Vermont educators are hoping Congress can help them out financially to safely reopen schools. Congressman Peter Welch testified before the House Education Committee Wednesday, giving law members an update on the HEROES Act and how it could benefit Vermont. Welch says it would provide over $3 billion to the state 
The money could be used for a variety of needs, including to provide safety equipment and improving broadband, which Wells says is vital for schools and health care. The HEROES Act passed the House last May, but the Senate has yet to vote. Peter, sa Peter Welch says he's discouraged but isn't giving up. Because I know that you're among the pressures that you face is how to help your schools uh, that each of you cherish. Well, we've got to get some help so they can upgrade those schools. Will we get uh, the HEROES Act or some version of it passed? Uh, I'm discouraged about it right now. You know, the House passed it 100 days ago. And the provisions that are in it, they're expensive. The HEROES Act would provide a $1,200 stimulus check to each household member up to $6,000. It would also provide $600 a week in unemployment benefits. A mask mandate has been put in place for youth and adult recreational league sports in Vermont. This is according to the latest guidelines from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Many sports like soccer and lacrosse were not held to a mask mandate when the ACCD released their initial recreational sports restart guidance back in June. The state's guidelines for middle and high school fall sports also say teams need face coverings for practice and for games. That mandate will happen September 8th, the same day schools across the Green Mountain State are set to open. For your latest coronavirus headlines and stories that matter to your family, head over to our website, myshamplainvalley.com. Well, a Plattsburgh native likes to stay active. She can't use her legs, but that doesn't stop her. The 30-year-old transgender disabled athlete wants to compete in the Paralympics one day. Local 44's Julie Sherman has her story. Amber Desjardins found running just three years ago, and this past Sunday, she ran in the 2020 Boilermaker 15K in Utica, New York, the longest run she's ever done. My name is Amber Desjardins, and I am just a disabled uh, trans athlete. But Amber isn't just anything. She is quite a leader in the community, having done 30 races as the only disabled wheelchair competitor. My wheelchair is just an extension of my life. Um, it's how I get around. It's my legs. Amber was diagnosed with cerebral palsy as a baby. Growing up, she always wanted to play sports but wasn't allowed to in high school. But that quickly changed. My one friend was like, well, why don't you take up running? Um, like running is a sport and you have a wheelchair, you have arms, you can push yourself. Amber's first run was in Burlington in 2017, around the time she started hormone treatments. But Amber has faced some backlash. She says people have told her that because she was born male, she has an unfair advantage. But she explained to me why that's not the case. When you start hormones, um, you change everything out of the sports car to, let's say, a Ford Focus. So being that it has Ford Focus parts, it's not going to run like a fancy sports car. I spoke with Amber's friend Jess Lashway. The two have only known each other for a few months, but she says Amber is her role model. She is such a strong athlete. People might think that the wheelchair might like drive her down, but it doesn't. If anything, she rises above it. In the meantime, Amber plans to prepare for the Paranordic skiing season and the Empire State Games in 2021, this time with a new $3,500 racing chair that she won in the Boilermaker 15K. Amber told me running not only makes her an athlete, but an activist as well. You know, make sure that like trans women have a place in women's sports. Make sure that disabled people um, have a place and get get the attention that they fully deserve as athletes. Reporting in Plattsburgh, Jolie Sherman, Local 44 News. One of America's favorite actors caught the virus. Coming up, a look into how The Rock and his family are doing. This is Local 44 Morning Brew with Abby Fridman, Libby Farrow, and Sky Tracker meteorologist Haley Boulay.
meteorologist Haley Boulay with your Sky Tracker forecast. Good morning, everybody. Well, our dew points are falling. We had a little bit of rain overnight, and the temperatures and dew points have matched. We're waking up to fog. A live look over the Northeast Kingdom right now, and you really can't see much out there. Currently, fog is filling in. Newport, one mile of visibility. St. J, same story. Zero down in Lebanon, about three in Saranac Lake. Once we warm up a little bit, those uh, temps will kind of get into the Low 70s, we'll start to see that fog clear out, but right now 59 degrees in Plattsburgh. Saranac Lake made a pretty significant jump, 48 the last time we talked. Now they're at 53 and 62 uh, for Lebanon dew points. Again, falling that cooler air, those darker greens and blues starting to move on in as we actually had a frontal boundary pass overnight. So this morning the fog is burning off and we are settling into a very sunny stretch of weather with 70s all week long. Except for today. Today is the only warm day. Yesterday's front brought us some showers overnight. Now it's sagging southward, and that's the first front. Unfortunately, what that front did was lower the dew points and kind of cut off this front. Because some dry air is in place, this frontal boundary here is kind of washing out, kind of falling apart with all the dry air from the lowering dew points. So we're not going to see much in the way of moisture with it. A couple of showers overnight that we'll track out in just a sec. Behind this front, though, takes away the heat and drops us back to average if not below average temperatures for the weekend. So today morning fog clears out. We're mostly sunny right around noontime. Southern and eastern zones may be noticing a little bit of filtered sunshine, some high thin cirrus clouds, maybe even blocking out the sun a little bit. That's a system well off the coast. No rain with it. Just a little bit more cloud cover. Temps low 80s while our dew points are in the mid 50s. Cooler, drier, comfortable air and winds are out of the south at 5 to 10. Overnight, we clear out pretty nicely, but as we head past midnight, there's that frontal boundary right there. But watch as it moves into St. Lawrence River Valley, Champlain Valley. It falls apart. Can't rule out a few spot showers overnight. This is at 1 a.m. And that's it. By the time we reach sunrise, it's washed out, it's cleared out, the clouds are gone, and we are mostly sunny. Temps are in the 50s, and Friday's forecast, you guessed it, mostly sunny skies and temperatures, mid-70s, dew points, mid to low 50s. Can't get better than that. But unfortunately, I do know that many folks are looking for rain. Drought monitor will be updated at 8.30 this morning. Hopefully, some of the rain that we saw on Saturday can help things out a little bit. But unfortunately, there isn't any steady, widespread, and heavy rain in the seven-day forecast. A little bit unsettled for Monday. That's the next chance for rain. Breezy conditions, too, but not that soaking that we really need to cut the drought. So the latest check of the forecast. Want to check out the forecast at any time. MyChamplainValley.com. Click on the weather tab. All right, thanks, Haley. Although we can't go to any fairs in person this year, we're still finding little ways to celebrate at home. Local 44's Brittany Weir is with one of our favorite foodies, Nancy Mock, to chat about some fair food recipes. Good morning, guys. Good morning, guys. This is a great, great day because we finally have Nancy back with us. I'm so excited. It's our first time meeting, so, yes, I'm so happy good morning. Good morning. And it's all about fair food because, you know, guys, we haven't been able to go to any, any fairs this summer because of the pandemic, but that's not going to stop us from enjoying this fabulous spread you have here. And guys, yes. I wish you could just be here and smell it. it smells amazing. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so hungry. So what do we have going on here? I thought these would be great to share this week because our Champlain Valley Fair normally runs the 10 days leading up to Labor Day. So this would be the week normally. And if you are craving that fair food and you can't get it at the fair, you can make it at home. Okay. Um, so we made some of my favorites. This is grilled sausage, peppers, and onions. Key um, to my heart. <laughs> Love it. Some brats um, that I cooked in a little bit of beer first and then finished off on the grill. And um, obviously bell peppers and onions on the grill as well. So they're charred and soft pile them into toasted um, sub rolls and um, it's just like having them at the fair. They look delicious. Thank so I was you. saying I'm Italian, so sausages and peppers, oh, right up my alley. One of my favorite it. savory things to get at the fair. Yes, and so then what's over here? You know, a little sweeter with the powdered sugar. Yes, this is a sweet treat from the fair fried dough. Classic uh, yeah. fair food that was always my favorite. It's um, a pizza type of dough that you make at home and let rise and then you cut it into pieces, heat up some oil, and fry up your fried dough. And when the dough is all fried like this, okay. I like to brush it with 
butter. My butter Ooh. used to be melted, but it got a little <laughs> More butter the better. Yep, yeah, more butter the better. We need more butter. And then um, your powdered sugar, cinnamon sugar, maple syrup, fruit sauces, chocolate syrup, and you could top it with whatever you want. I would probably do like the chocolate sauce. I mm -hmm. love chocolate, so that would be my go-to. Yeah, oh blueberry my. sauce. The blueberries are in season right now. If you cook down your fresh blueberries, those are also be delicious on the fried dough. And I so yeah, like you were saying, I feel like, you know, we're whether it's like a zeppoli I was saying or a funnel cake or whatever, that's just like a staple of the fair. You see that, you see the powdered sugar and you think fair. Yeah. So. And it's indulgent, you know, you don't get to have it that often, but it's just one of those treats that when you see it at the fair and you smell it, you're just like, yes. Like fried I said, dough. the smell. The smell out here is amazing. <laughs> oh my gosh. And then going back to, you know, the sausages and peppers, you said that you um, cook them in a beer. Mm -hmm. Does it matter which beer or is it what kind or is that kind of really. up to you? You can kind of play around. I just used to go with a regular lager to cook them in. Um, and it's just bratwurst again. But I like cooking them in the beer first on the stovetop because then you don't have the sausages splitting as much on the grill. You can cook them all the way through without burning them and having them leak out all their juiciness yeah. on the grill. So yeah, in the beer first and then finish them on the grill. So they get those marks. We um, want to keep that juiciness in and, there. Yeah, keep them juicy as possible. And is there anything um, special that you do with, you know, the peppers or the bun? Do you toast the bun, anything like that? Or just kind of, again, what you prefer? I like to slice the um, bell peppers and the onions into rings and toss them with a little bit of oil. And then I have one sheet pan that is dedicated for the grill. I pile them all on the sheet pan and let them cook on there. That way they're not falling through the grates. They, they brown up on the grill pan. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, that's how they cook up. So if any of our viewers want to try these delicious recipes, where can they find them? Because I know they're once seeing them, they're going to want to try them. So where can yes. they get that? My recipes are at my website, which is called HungryEnoughToEat6.com. When you go to the homepage, all of my fair recipes are right there at the beginning, so you can't miss them. Awesome, so bring the fair home with you guys this year. If you're yes. missing that fair food, you can find the recipes, cook them yourself, and enjoy a great lunch, dinner, whatever. But mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for joining us this morning, but we'll have more with you coming up later. So if you're still hungry, st stick with us. We'll show some more fair food. Two more. <laughs> but for now, back to you guys in the studio. Local news that matters on Local 44 News.
local news that matters on Local 44 News. Well, here is what's trending. The highest paid actor in the world has tested positive for COVID-19. Dwayne The Rock Johnson revealed on Instagram that he, his wife Lauren, and their two daughters all got the diagnosis. In a video, he said they caught the infection from close family friends. Johnson also says his family got those test results more than two weeks ago and have now recovered. He called the disease one of the most challenging and difficult things they had ever had to endure as a family. And Carol Baskin from the Netflix docu-series Tiger King will be competing in the new season of Dancing with the Stars. The animal activist was one of the many stars revealed Wednesday on Good Morning America. Here are some of the others. There's Grammy Award winner rapper Nelly, Backstreet Boys AJ McLean, former Catfish TV host Neve Shulman, and Olympic figure skater and on-air commenter Johnny Weir. Also, Tyra Banks will take over as the host. And 25 years after releasing his smash hit, Gin and Juice, Snoop Dogg is launching his own brand of gin. He's calling it Indigo and says he can't wait for the world to taste what he calls his remix on gin. Snoop is partnering with Trusted Spirits and a New York City company that helps celebrities develop their own brands of alcohol. They say the rapper is a gin connoisseur who took two years to come up with the perfect blend. Bottles will first be sold in California later this month. And now it's time for a look at the latest headlines from the world of entertainment. Here's Douglas Hyde with the Hollywood Minute. Mandalorian, look outside. They are waiting for you. The wait for season two of The Mandalorian will soon be over. Disney Plus announced the wildly popular Star Wars series will return on October 30th. It'll have a lot to live up to. The first season was a huge hit and has been nominated for 15 Emmy Awards, including Outstanding Drama Series. Shouldn't you be at work then? <laughs> Britain's Prince Harry and his wife Meghan Markle have inked a multi-year deal with Netflix. The royal couple, who now live in California, will produce shows, films, and documentaries for the streaming giant. Two projects are already underway, a nature docu-series and an animated series that'll celebrate inspiring women. This ship bears the name Discovery. She has carried us into the future. Star Trek Discovery is boldly going where no Trek series has gone before. The CBS All Access show will introduce audiences to the sci-fi franchise's first transgender and non-binary characters next month. Ian Alexander and newcomer Blue Del Barrio will step into those roles for the upcoming third season, which kicks off October 15th. In Hollywood, I'm Douglas Hyde. This is Local 44 Morning Brew with Abby Friedman, Libby Farrow, and Sky Tracker meteorologist Haley Blue.
756. Good morning. I'm Abby Fridman. And I'm Libby Faro. Rutland Regional Medical Center will again host a pop-up testing site on campus to help put people at ease following the recent outbreak in Killington. A steady stream of people got a test Wednesday. We were told that entire process went quickly. People were in and out in about 10 to 15 minutes. A pop-up testing will be going on at RRMC from 9 until 3 through Saturday. Vermont schools are preparing to reopen next Tuesday, and in Burlington, officials took question from the community in a town hall meeting. Mayor Murrow Weinberger and the superintendent Don Flanag Tom Flanagan were joined by a pediatric infectious disease specialist who attempted to reassure concerned parents. He noted that school-based studies have shown that children infrequently spread COVID-19 to other students and or adults, and said kids are also less efficient at transmitting the virus. There has also been optimism. In New Hampshire, health experts say they found the first batch of mosquitoes in the state to test positive for West Nile virus this year. This happened in Manchester. West Nile is transmitted to humans from the bite of an infected mosquito. The most recent human case was in an adult about three years ago. Now, meteorologist Haley Boulay with your Sky Tracker forecast. Good morning, folks. Just before 8 o'clock, we have some high, thin, wispy clouds as you look over the Champlain Valley. This morning, some fog filling in for the Winooski River Valley as well. Temps. Heading out the door, it's 62 in Burlington, 59 in Plattsburgh, 61 in St. Jay, and 62 in Montpelier with those fogs, those area of fog. <laughs> words are hard this morning. Those areas of fog burning off pretty quickly. We're mostly sunny. You may notice a few high, thin clouds filtering out the sun for the afternoon, but we stay dry. We stay pretty mild with temperatures climbing into the low 80s, dew points back into the 50s. Check your seven day forecast. Quiet weather all the way through the weekend. We get a little unsettled as you look towards Monday, Labor Day with some scattered showers and breezy conditions. You're watching local news.